See, there's something within us that wants to leave a legacy. But here's the thing you need to know is if God asks you to do something, don't look at the size of the job, look at the size of your God who asked you to do it. See, he laid down his life for you, so that tells me that you are not worthless, you are worthy. And this is what he wants to rewrite into your story. That reality impacts everything. Welcome, small groups. I am so excited to have you uh, and uh, your group diving into Ruth together. You guys should have just finished reading Ruth chapter one. And the book of Ruth is just such a cool book that talks about, really kind of sets up this subject of the ordinary person, Ruth, who uh, does an extraordinary thing and is used by God in extraordinary ways. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way. like. I'm just kind of fill in the blank of what that is. Uh, and maybe you'll actually get into that in your small groups today is that I'm just, I'm just what? What is it that you've kind of just belittled yourself or thought I'm just this. And thus I just never thought that God could use me in extraordinary ways. And yet that is such the message of the book of Ruth is that God uses the ordinary and the mundane to do extraordinary things. And so I'm gonna kind of just, I'm not gonna read all of chapter one, you've just read it, but I'm gonna highlight a few things along the way and hopefully set us up for a good conversation here. So uh, as you dove into uh, chapter one, you know right out of the gate by verse four, you've got Naomi and her husband who are in another country. And and they have actually, they've left their home, they've left Jerusalem, they've left Israel, and they've gone to a foreign nation. And really, kind of some of my observations from this weekend, maybe you can actually relate to Naomi and her husband, kind of in this way, is that what they were doing, because Israel was in famine, they were seeking a solution outside of God. They were trying to go after it and figure out their own problem on their own. And, um, I know a lot of times we get into this where we feel, man, I've got a problem. I've got something I've got to solve on my, on my own. And you feel like, let's go after this on my own. And sometimes the very person who we should be pressing into is the Lord. That's where Naomi and her husband should have been pressing into is God. But instead, they look to a neighboring nation to see if they can solve their solution or find a solution to their problem on their own. And maybe for some of you, You've thought to yourself, I, in my life, I've walked away from the Lord. And maybe you've even thought, I've gone too far. I've gone too far to maybe ever be used by God in an extraordinary way. And I just want to speak this over, over you, is that you can never go too far. You can never go too far from the Lord that he can't get you and that he can't redeem your situation and draw you back home. Um, and so I don't know for you how far you found yourself from God, but the reality is it's never too far from him. And so maybe in your small groups, maybe you'll even uh, share some stories, uh, maybe a time in your life when you believed the lie that you had gone too far. How did the Lord bring you back? How did he draw you in? Um, how did you find yourself coming home? And then in verse five through 10, kind of everything unfolds in uh, an even worse way. Naomi's husband dies, her sons die, she's left with uh, two daughter-in-laws who are with her, and they're kind of in a perfect storm moment where uh, three widows all together, and things really couldn't get a whole lot worse, at least in that day and age, where you would find your confidence in your husband, in his ability to supply income and provision for your family, as well as protection over your family. And so now here you've got these three widows, and what do they do next? And in verses 11 through 13, Naomi goes on to speak to her daughter-in-laws and try to convince them to go home. Uh, really looking at the situation and going, this is your best bet. There's no way that I can, even if I went home and I could find a husband today and bear you both new, you know, bear sons, uh, there's no way that you're gonna hang out long enough to marry them and that I can uh, provide you with new husbands. And so she's saying your best bet in life, in our situation is to go home to your, to your families. And, um, but what's really interesting is at the end of verse 13, Naomi throws a statement out that actually kind of becomes the flavor and the attitude that she has toward God in this situation. She makes the statement, she says, um, the Lord has raised his fist against me. Final line of verse 13, the Lord has raised his fist against me. And what's interesting here, and I think we do this as humans all the time, we, often blame God 
for our situation when we were the ones who walked away. So for Naomi and her husband, they were the ones who left. And yet, in the midst of their crisis and her crisis, she finds herself blaming God. And I don't know about you, but how often do we blame God for our situation when we actually got ourselves into it? You know, last week, my wife and I, we were sharing in the small group video here about um, uh, that financial situation where we got ourselves in debt um, when we bought a, a, a timeshare. And I remember in that, it was, a, it was just a bad financial move for us, but I remember that exact same statement kind of coming out of my mouth in the midst of this kind of really, I was frustrated. I was frustrated with God, and I remember I asked him, I was like, God, why did you let us get here? Why did you bring us here? What are you trying to teach us here? It's like this Holy Spirit so gently, uh, you know, he just like spoke to me and he's like, I didn't lead you here, you did. I mean, it was like this really sweet way in which he was like, had you been listening to me, I wouldn't have brought you here. Now the Lord actually can redeem that situation just like he does here with, with Naomi. Is He's gonna redeem the whole picture. And for me, even in my own life, I think God has used that story, that big mistake, that financial kind of flub, if you will, many times over to encourage people to make wise choices with their finances. And even for myself, I've, it's been a learning uh, point in my life. But the Lord was reminding me, I'm not the one to blame here. You actually walked here. You chose to go here. You chose to do something that I wasn't leading you into. And so how do we sometimes blame God for the situations that we put ourselves in? Verse 14, as we continue on in the chapter, I made this observation about Orpah. So Orpah's the other daughter-in-law. And I talked about this, how she is a professor, but not a possessor. And what I meant by that was both daughter-in-laws profess, we will follow you. We're gonna follow you home to your homeland. We'll never leave you. But then when the rubber hits the road and the choice is really being made, Orpah turns around and goes home while we see that Ruth is clinging to Naomi. She's the one who is holding dear and holding tight to her. She's the one who's actually possessing her. So you've got a professor, both of them profess, but only one of them possess. And what I mean by that in terms of even in our own lives is how many of us uh, find ourselves or others who are professors of Christ, but not possessors of Christ. And what I mean by that is they say, of course I'm a Christian, but Christ is not evident anywhere in their life. The Christ is not with them because they're not with him. And I just wonder, um, for some of us, is there an honest moment where you might be able to say, there was a season in my life where I was a professor but not a possessor. What are common elements that were happening during my life that perhaps led me to say that this is who I believe about God to be and I, I profess him as my Lord and Savior, but I was not walking with him? in my life. So it's a moment when uh, right here in this story, though, where we see uh, what sets Ruth apart is that she's not just a professor, she is a possessor. And what sets her apart is that uh, and sets this ordinary young lady up to do extraordinary things is really uh, it unfolds in the next couple verses. And verse 16 becomes the crux of the whole chapter where Ruth makes this statement that probably if you've read the Bible before, or you've been a Christian for a period of time, you've heard this statement, this statement that says, where, uh, where you go, I go, where you stay, I'll stay, or it could be translated, where you live, I'll live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And she um, makes this huge, bold statement. And the way I summarized it this weekend was kind of the two T's in the midst of trials, the, that she demonstrates tenacity and trust in the midst of her trial. Tenacity simply being this diligent stubbornness. It's funny, but she is. She's so diligent and really stubborn that she's not gonna leave, um, leave Naomi. And trust, putting your faith in something you can't see in the midst of the trial. And I say in the midst of the trial because it's so interesting that chapter one, it doesn't end well. Like, it is this chapter that ends kind of feeling really bad. And in many ways, the trial or the lack of resolve in the trial is, is probably one of the largest 
um, lessons that we learn in chapter one. It's how do we respond when the story hasn't yet ended well? Um, how, how do we respond when the chapter of our life that we find ourselves in um, doesn't seem to have a happy ending? At least right now, it, it's not ending well. And what are the things that, that Ruth demonstrated in the trial that set this ordinary girl up to do extraordinary things? And the answer is found in verse 16. It's this tenacity and trust that she, tenacity to follow Naomi and a tenacity to trust even in the Lord, a, a God who really wasn't her God. It wasn't what she grew up with. It wasn't her faith base, but she's going, I've seen enough about the God of Israel that I'm choosing, I'm going to trust him um, right now in the middle of my situation. And maybe some of you have been thinking to yourself, um, me becoming a tenacious follower of God and trusting him boldly are like crazy ideas for me. Like eh, maybe <laughs> don't look around the room right now at your small group, but you might be thinking uh, him, her, can they really be tenacious about their faith and bold in their trust of God with their faith? And maybe you're sitting there feeling like everyone's staring at you, never you. And I'm telling you, um, it is for you. That's the probably the best uh, thing we learn about Ruth is that if there was ever someone who didn't feel like they belonged, they weren't a part of the family, they weren't on the inside track, they weren't a part of the chosen people, she would, there was nothing in her life that made her feel like that I would have uh, argued that, that she could say, this is for me to be special in, uh, or to be used in a special way by the God of Israel. Like nothing would have set her up for that belief. And yet she goes after it. Um, and so I, I, in your small groups, I don't know, I, I would really encourage you to ask this question. What would tenacity and trust look like in your life for every one of you, everyone in the group? How, how would it look? See, what Ruth does is she demonstrates this, I'm all in this, even though she hasn't seen where God is yet in this. She's, I'm, I'm all in even though I haven't yet seen where God is working in the midst of this trial. And so two kind of final questions to set you up for a conversation here. First question would be this, uh, where would you like to see God invade your life? Uh, it, it can be any type of situation, a relational situation, a hard decision you need to make, um, a trial that you're facing at work, um, it could be a, a family issue. Maybe it's a, an estranged family member. When you're sitting there going, this will take a miracle. This would take God invading the space um, for, for, you know, for it to be fixed. Okay, so share that trial. Then, as a group, I'd love to see you guys kind of brainstorm for one another and say, okay, what could it look like for you to demonstrate tenacity and a trust of God um, in that area of your life, and specifically to move into that area, trusting him and, uh, and setting him up to do something in a powerful way prior to ever seeing him show up on the scene. What would that look like? Because I believe so much of this model of the ordinary being used to do the extraordinary is taking bold steps of uh, tenacity and trust in the Lord before he arrives on the scene in the midst of the trial. So I, th I think you're gonna have some really fun conversations, hopefully some eye-opening moments and some real encouragement for, for one another. I really want you to look at one another and say, you can do this. To this week, go after it to step into a, a bold step, a tenacious move, and a big way of trusting God in that area while you're in the midst of the trial, before you see God show up on the scenes. And I believe you're setting uh, God up to use you and the ordinary person to do extraordinary things. So we'll see you guys next week. Enjoy your conversations.